Okay, I think this is the cue for us uh, to start. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're here in uh, ses session 17, which is titled uh, Bond Markets During the COVID-19. My name is Sigal Ribon, I'm from the Bank of Israel. Uh, we have three papers today. Uh, all three papers have uh, discussants. We have two hours for this session, so I suggest 40 minutes for each paper, 20 minutes for uh, more or less 20, 25 minutes for a presentation, another 10 minutes for a discussion for the discussant, and uh, a few more minutes for a general discussion. Uh, so let us start with the first paper, which is uh, Sovereign Bonds and Flight to Safety, Implications of Pandemic for Sovereign, sovereign Debt Markets in the G7 and E7, and uh, Toan Lu, Duke Yoon from WHO uh, will present the paper. So uh, the floor is yours, please. Uh, just one, uh, one more uh, remark. Uh, you can uh, write the Q and A's in the Q and A uh, icon and, and we can look at them after the presentation. So please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. So, um, now I'm very happy to uh, present my working paper with my co-author, uh, Muhammad Ali Nazir, Ngoc Thi Langle, Yasra Gapri, and I'm uh, Tang. Uh, I'm PhD student in WSU and also affiliate, research affiliate in University of Economics, Hong Kong Ministry and EPAT Business School. So uh, my talk today will last in 20 minutes uh, and we'll go through with four part motivation uh, and literature review, uh, the data and methodology as well as summary of result and a conclusion. So uh, let's talk about my motivate our motivations. So uh, the COVID-19 happens in uh, 2020, uh, 2020 and it has consequences. Then uh, in some aspect you can witness that uh, the skyrocket of government uh, stimulus. Some country, they spend a lot of money for long term. Uh, they also impact on the fiscal, uh, fiscal sustainability and also emerging, uh, in some emerging economies role, there's also the capital fly from another country to another country. At that time in 2020, there's no information regarding vaccinations. Then uh, in the report of Institute of International Finance, you also witness that there's a cross border capital outflows of over more than $100 billion. Then they also have like problem with their serene bond developed in emerging market. Then actually at that time, we also need to know how to perform. Then uh, the literature need to have like empirical evidence and also, I also want to highlight a problem that the original scene that some, let's say like some uh, uh, domestic currency can be not used at a low uh, borrowing in the, in the other uh, foreign countries. And any explanation for that area, so you can see that like the borrowing cost and uh, fiscal prudent, then also the problem regarding to uh, flexibility of economy, the transparency of information and also like country fiscal uh, credibilities. You also found that like uh, in G7 economies have the lower likelihood of default, then they also uh, need to keep reputations. Then in argument like severe debt, less risky than private. Then also uh, we also, uh, see that like the tech interventions regarding to dependent on macroeconomics and financial conditions. And then also another aspect, we also look at like the poor ESG, the public deficits and higher debt, they also make the bond market have like risk, riskier and higher return. So uh, in terms of literature review, you also might see that like, there's also like steady uh, steadily increase in the popularities and importance after a global financial crisis and euro debt prices. This is also like problem regarding to the 2007, 2008, and also euro debt prices increase in 2014. Then also we also witnessed that some emerging economies bond move closely with the tandem with the U.S. Treasury yields. Then we also witnessed that the risk-free global bank must yield why have an interest rate to E7 countries? Then we also 
uh, need to know the, uh, the problem regarding to the movement, the capital flow movement be between G7 and E7 countries uh, with the portfolio diversifications. That does mean, does mean that uh, you also see the macroeconomic outlook, money, monetary policies and ma market infrastructures. This is also a problem that E7 uh, countries they might face. Then also uh, ease of, uh, emerging market government depending on the capital flow. This means that you also think uh, the international government born, uh, the emerging market uh, born also more vulnerable because higher debt, fewer uh, av available sources to repay debt and emerging market also have like, the problem with their political regimes. So uh, emerging market, um, also have to uh, rely on a stronger foreign currency, for example, uh, US dollars and euro. So for example, like G7 can borrow a domestic currency. However, like E7, like emerging market, they cannot do the same thing. So that's a like, problem that the civilian born in the emerging market, they need to face. So the current literatures, they, they only look at like the determinant of long-term bond yield in the advanced economies. For example, they look at uh, physical deficits, escalates the cost borrowing. Uh, in the emerging market, also catching uh, the scholar's attentions regarding to uh, external vulnerability, uh, for example, like external, external debt, debt services or current account positions. And also in emerging market, we also have to face with the physical debts and deficit also problem. And in the study of mean, we also saw like the macroeconomic factors also impact on the emerging market. Then there, there are several paper they look at like coal, uh, uh, let's say like uh, together, like simultaneous emerging and advanced market. That's mean they look at like how the policy uh, announcement can relate it to inflation uh, expectations or foreign participations or John dynamics effects or the global uh, liquidities. Then uh, what's the you can different uh, different ventures like uh, international risk factor could be like the determinant. The credit risk also can explain regarding to uh, the different bond you in E7 and G7. Then, uh, and the liquidity risk spread also like the factor that we need to consider. However, uh, the COVID-19 happened in 2020, then this is also not only the health crisis, but also COVID-19 also have like very adverse impact as well, like financial consequences. So uh, another consider consideration that we need to consider that there's also have a significant risk to emerging, emerging as well developed economies. So in this paper, we want to extend the literature by looking at the COVID-19 in, in, in the context of emerging as well as like uh, advanced economies. So uh, we need to, to explain the sovereign bond and financial market uh, assets. So there also there is like a relatively safer uh, values for investment. So it's mean like many people also think uh, G7, uh, G7 also better. Then also there's a literature regarding to safe haven literatures. For example, like sovereign bond forex, then also like different kind of stock, different commodities, for example, like the, the roll of gold or silver platinum. Then there's also uh, several paper regarding to how the Sabina bond can be done in with the existence of gold in the portfolio. So some paper, they also indicate there's a cold move across the different markets with gold and sovereign bond. And also we, uh, some, some uh, let's say some scholars, they also suggest that we can replace equity with bond to have like less risk portfolio and uh, the, the relationship between the excesses, stock market volatilities and the sovereign bond market. So in, uh, in this paper, we, we want to look at like sovereign bond versus COVID-19. So uh, COVID-19 happened as an unprecedented event with the high uncertainty in the global financial market. And also uh, 
COVID-19 also offered the economic downturn since the Great Depression. Then we also look at like the huge fluctuations in the financial markets. Then in this study, we attempt to answer two questions. The first question is, how do G7 and E7 surveillance bonds respond to COVID-19? So we capture the proxies regarding to COVID-19, severity as like the number of global cases and the country cases, whether G7 and E7 can act as like protectors, again, loses in, in the market with a lot of uncertainties. However, like we, we want to highlight that the previous study, there's no previous study regarding to sovereign bond yield response to COVID-19. Sovereignty, we didn't know regarding to uh, country economic and financial development impact their response. Then uh, no study look at like the connectedness uh, among two markets, sovereign bond in uh, G7 and E7. And uh, in the previous uh, study, didn't look at like COVID-19 severity as a predictive power on the connectedness between two, two markets, G7 and E7 economies. So uh, in the data and methodologies, I, I want to highlight something regarding to our data. Uh, in this paper, we look at like COVID-19 global at uh, global and country, the yield, the interest rate, the exchange rate, the stock market return and market capitalization and control of variables. Then we also uh, take uh, the first COVID-19 cases confirmed in the Pacific date. This is uh, in this uh, in the left side, we also have like G7 and on the right side, we also have like E7 uh, with the different dates. Then we also uh, dare to, uh, we also use panel data analysis and also use like TBV var, time variance parameter to estimate. Uh, it's mean in our, in our, uh, pan panel data, we, we want to look at whether COVID-19 severity can uh, predict uh, how the bond you. And after that, we estimate the total connectedness between G7 and E7, and we use a COVID, COVID indicator to predict the total connectedness after we control uh, every factors. So uh, in this slide, I would like to summarize of main findings regarding to uh, the time varying the dynamics of sovereign bond yield. As you can see on the left side, this is the bond yield in the G7, and on the right side, is the bond yield in the e, uh, E7. You also see that like E7 uh, countries started to show the crop in yield, the result vary among E7. For example, in China, they also witnessed like the increase, however, like in, in Canada, the degrees and also in US also have witnessed the degrees. And Germany is still explicit the negative use. Uh, this means like the strength of Ger German bond. And also Italy have the threat uh, with a physical stress like European civilian debt crisis before. And also like uh, Italy also have like some problem with uh, the number of cases in the very beginning of uh, COVID-19 uh, period. Uh, after that, we we want to to uh, merge the data and also look at like the panel data, and we also see the positive and uh, significant effect on the daily growth uh, COVID nineteen confirmed cases on the severe ten year bond yield at a five percent, and. <clears throat> We also look at like the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on a sovereign bond in, in, in different aspects. From we also look at like the, the effect of there's also hetero uh, heterogeneous effect regarding to the global uh, the global market and also the uh, the country cases uh, in specific differences. So when we look at uh, when we look at uh, the COVID-19 and sovereign bond you in G7 and E7. We use like the, uh, we merge the data and use the dummy variable for G7 and E7 to, to separate two variable. Then we also see that like the G7 and E7 dummy variable is positive and significant. This means E7 have the higher suffering bond yield than G7 country that you can see in a row three here. That's mean G7, uh, uh, E7 also experienced uh, the higher yield uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic period. Then 
uh, we, we want to look at like subsample group and uh, subsample group we also uh, look at like only uh, G7 and E7 and we found like the growth ca uh, confirmed cases in country also negatively uh, impact on the bond yield in G7 countries. However, we do not find any uh, significant evidence for E7 countries. Then after that, we also uh, use a passionate check for, uh, for difference uh, for using a random effect and our previous results still hold. Um, uh, because like there also uh, in the previous slide I also mentioned that some uh, some country they have the different case of confirmed cases at the beginning for example like Canada has a uh, 26 however in the US they also have 22nd or uh, Turkey Russia and the other country have the different so that reason why in our model we might have faced with the the different structure of break so that reason why we imply the um, by Baron uh, for uh, estimate how many structural break that we, we might face in our model. So we felt like there are three main structural break, then we also control for further estimation. So after we control the structural break, here we also felt like the growth confirmed cases also negatively predict uh, the G7 suffering bond yield and also uh, growth in confirmed cases in E7 country also positively uh, predict the bond yield in E7 country. So that's the reason why we want to, to draw the conclusion that the structural prank also impact uh, uh, on, the, on the sovereign bond yield in different two area with the different impact. So uh, in that sense, in the next slide, I want to look at like the total connectedness uh, of sovereign bond yield. That's I only look at like, um, uh, G7 and E7. So we also see that like uh, since March 2020, this is the time that WHU declared that COVID-19 as a global health public crisis. That's the reason why the connectedness between the G7 and E7 also highest with more than six, nearly 90% of connectedness. And after that, some country, they also try to apply several uh, several, uh, let's say, like packages to contain the, the spread of COVID-19 and that's a connectedness can reduce. And after that, after the summer, they also witnessed like the increase. Then uh, when we look at next spillover effect uh, across economies from December 2020 to August 2021, we also look at the shock center included like uh, Canada, UK, US and Turkey, they are sending shock to the other market. However, uh, France, Germany, Italy, uh, Mexico, Russia, they also have like passive position to receive the shock from this country. So after, after we, ask, uh, we estimate the total connectedness, we want to look at whether the COVID-19 severity can predict the connectedness because like the connectedness representative for um, the total risk, uh, spillover risk. So we also found that like the rows in COVID-19 cases uh, can predict quite a marginal effect. However, at that time, we look at like crow COVID-19 death can also uh, predict the connectedness uh, quite stronger, uh, predict uh, total connectedness between G7 and E7. And uh, in our model, we also control for uh, EMV, uh, market volatility, equity market volatility, uh, equity stock going through uh, crude oil. Uh, then uh, this is the last slide. Uh, in my my presentations uh, that uh, we want to summarize up a uh, result that the financial market are not immune to the COVID-19 pandemic. We also look at the fly to safety and the role of sovereign bond as a safe haven for the global capital flows. Then uh, the US and the other developed uh, economies, we also have a very good safe haven, lower yield for G7 economies. Then E7, uh, despite their rapid growth in a recent part, does not provide a safe haven in a strong form of sovereign bond. Then that's we want to suggest uh, to confirm the roles of a strain in G7. And we also want to, uh, to, to, 
propose for policy implications that we need to control the spillover effect between G7 and E7 economies, then uh, COVID-19 sovereignty can predict the bonds sovereign connecting it as well, like bonds of you. So this is my, uh, my presentations for today uh, within 20 minutes. Then um, I'm very happy to receive any comments and feedback. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Tuan, uh, also for keeping the 20 minute uh, limit. So now we have uh, the discussant, Mariano Croce from uh, uh, Bocconi University. So if you could share your slides. I hope you're with us. Yeah. I am. I am. Yes. Very Can you good. see my screen? Yes, we do. Great. Please. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to discuss this paper. Okay, so here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you just the big picture of why this is important. Probably uh, this is not going to be surprising given the title of the section my takeaways and then some reinterpretation of the results. Okay, so big picture, uh, pandemic events were rare events in the past. You know, pre 1980s, uh, they were not a big deal. They were happening uh, once every two decades and they were kind of short. Nowadays, instead the, the uh, pandemic events are becoming more frequent. So starting uh, the, the, the reaction of, uh, the markets to COVID-19 is not just uh, uh, the study of a single disruptive uh, event. It, it can teach you something about the future uh, pandemic situations. Okay, so let me tell you what are the main results from this paper. Result number one, if you look at the G7 countries, long-term bonds, sovereign bonds are a good edge against global uh, news about uh, COVID-19 related the cases, okay, contagion news. And uh, why do I read this? Well, what the authors uh, document is that when cases increase at the global level, the yields of long-term bonds in G7 countries tend to, to decrease. But uh, we know that there is a negative relation between yields and bond price. So what this means is that uh, excess returns go up. If you believe that uh, a pandemic event is a bad state of the world, this is what in modern finance we call an insurance asset. Uh, when you turn your attention to emerging economies, actually um, there is nothing statistically significant. So the best we can say is that uh, it doesn't look like these bonds uh, are an edge against the global COVID-19 uh, news. We have mixed evidence in the paper with respect to local um, cases. Uh, what this means is that uh, even for developed countries, it's not clear whether when cases in a specific country increase the yield of the, the bonds issued by the government of the country um, adjust. And then the other thing that, uh, that we have seen at the end of the presentation is that the global equity volatility explains uh, a lot of the correlation slash connectedness uh, across the bond markets. Okay, so these are uh, um, the main findings, super interesting. And uh, what I'm gonna do is to look at these results from a different uh, perspective. Um, okay, so let me disclose that uh, the next slides are taken actually from a joint paper with the uh, three super energetic uh, PhD students at Bocconi, Isabella, she's originally from the US, she monitors uh, um, uh, North America for us, um, uh, Maho, she monitors uh, emerging countries in Latin America, and then Paolo monitors Europe and other emerging countries in Asia. So um, uh, th this paper of mine is related to the one I presented here, but not identical. We have uh, different uh, contributions. Uh, let me tell you uh, the following thing. We focus a lot on the reaction of bond and equity markets around COVID-19 specific announcements, but we have a second part of the paper in which we estimate a, a no arbitrage model uh, for both bonds and equities for big cross-section of developed uh, and emerging countries. Let me tell you specifically what we do. Uh, we look at both um, uh, COVID-19 related news measured as 
unexpected varia variation in the number of confirmed cases at the global level. We call this an objective okay, uh, measure just because you count the number of new cases. But the other thing that we do is actually to scrap um, Twitter and recover news from major newspapers across 21 different economies. And why is that important? That's important because once you scrap all of this news from official newspapers, you can uh, analyze the tone of these tweets, of this news. And so you can have uh, a measure of perceived risk across different waves, you know, number of cases change meaning. Another good news about this is that you can uh, you can have a very an abundance of observations. You are no longer required to run just daily regressions. So you can also run intra-daily regressions, and that's because the analysis of the tweets can be very, very thin on the timeline. Okay, so this is the model that we have. It's a conditional no arbitrage model. We assume that uh, sensitivities across uh, portfolios of countries are time varying. Let me tell you how we form the portfolios. We rank countries according to the share of cases in a specific country with respect to the entire cross section that we measure. So a portfolio denoted by H bundles together both emerging economies and advanced economies with a huge percentage of cases of COVID. So we think about that as a country that has uh, almost mechanically high exposure to COVID news. Um, this time varying beta is modeled as a linear function of the share of cases. And the very last thing that you need to know, very standard uh, by no arbitrage, is that the variation in the um, risk premium for each asset allows us to identify the market price or risk of this news. That's all you need to know. Okay, so this is where you know I'm going to start to ask questions to tone. Uh, let me introduce this figure and let me just tell you what, what this is. On the left hand side, we focus on the estimation of the previous model based only on, a subs, on, on advanced economies. So a sub segment of our cross section. On the right hand side, we estimate our no arbitrage model looking only at emerging economies. For each group of countries, you have bonds and you have equities. What do we plot here? Here we plot the implied expected return from investing in sovereign bonds in advanced economies. But in particular, this is an HML COVID strategy. What I'm doing here is to go long in a portfolio of countries that has a very high exposure to COVID and go short in the set of countries that have a relatively lower share of cases. And uh, here is the first point that I want to make. I, I totally agree with, uh, with Ton. It's true that for emerging economies, uh, yields have increased in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis. But actually, I think that it's very, very important uh, to look within emerging economy across countries that have been very affected and countries that have not been so affected by the pandemics. Why? If you look at the bond market, regardless of whether you, fo you focus on advanced economies or emerging economies, you see that a strategy long in treasuries of countries with a high number of cases and short in countries with a relatively low number of cases actually has produced a very good edge. In particular, notice that here we have the zero line. What this estimation implies is that the strategy has produced a negative risk premium, so a pretty substantial insurance. I double checked our results. Uh, what you found is totally correct. It's totally consistent with what we found. It is true that yields have gone up for emerging economies. But the key point is that they have adjusted very differently across high COVID countries and low COVID countries. And in particular, what you see is that high COVID countries um, have, um, have remained particularly safe compared to low COVID countries. This is a statement about sovereign bonds. 
this is not a statement about the equity market. If you look at the equity market of emerging economies and you focus on the implied risk premium of an HML strategy based on number of COVID cases, then the picture, the picture is totally reversed. It's totally true that risk premia have gone up um, in a very substantial way. And if you guys at home wonder how come that these estimates have a very different shape, let me remind you that China is in this group and that this initial huge peak that you observe over here is mainly driven by China. And the other thing that you need to realize is that many of the Latin American um, emerging economies that we have in our cross section started to get in trouble with delay. And that's because, uh, you know, many of them are actually on the other side of, uh, of the, on the other hemisphere. And so uh, the pandemic uh, really became a problem with the five or six months of delay. So what do I want to say here? Other point, if I have a minute, is actually the following. When you look at advanced economies, you do see that an HML strategy that is long in, in the treasuries or countries with the high COVID cases produces a little bit of insurance, okay? But it's not so substantial. And what uh, we, we, we have done in the paper is to show that uh, actually the, there are a lot of reasons why this could be the case, but the most plausible reason is simply that the central banks in these countries uh, are nowadays so good at managing yields that probably the decline in the risk premium is so moderate compared to emerging economies just because of quantitative easing and uh, um, similar uh, liquidity intervention by central banks. Okay, so I'm not sure how much time I have. Let me just conclude saying the following. Wonderful. I really learned a lot, very good paper. I learned a lot and I'm, I'm actually very happy that uh, you found that with a very different methodology, very consistent results with respect to the bond market compared to what we have. And the other thing that I would like to say is that uh, I really think that your contribution is very important and it's a starting point to think about the role of pandemics across different countries that differ mainly because of their exposure to the pandemic event itself. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mariano. Um, we have one uh, question that was uh, uploaded by Talisa Falianti from the University of Indonesia. So maybe I'll read it and Tuan, if you want to uh, respond. Uh, I'm not sure you can see, all of you can see the Q&A, so I will read it. What is your suggestion for E7 countries in facing the pandemic and bond interconnectedness? And how about the anticipation on U.S. tapering and U.S. Treasury bond steepening after U.S. economic recovery? Many thanks for a nice research presentation. So, Tuan, do you want to respond to the discussion and to the question? Maybe yeah. other people will... Yeah, but actually I think I will type to save the time. So I will type and uh, maybe the next presentation could be happened now. Okay, so may I have a, a short question, if that's okay. Um, Please. I was wondering whether uh, I put on my video, um, if I understand right, you didn't have um, any control for monetary policy in each of the countries. So. Can you really distinguish whether it's the COVID-19 or whether it's the monetary policy that went uh, together with it? So I think this is uh, this might be something to think about also, whether COVID-19 is really the, the confirmed cases or it's the policy that uh, accompanied it. Yeah, yeah actually, I think, um, actually, I think we, 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 I agree that we need to control for the monetary policy uh, that your situation. Then I, uh, I think uh, monetary was already easing, easing, and like a little, a little done. So I think uh, we we can do that. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I see there's another question here. Uh, Jonathan Ben Shimon. Um, I have a question for both Mariano and Tuan. Do you think the market efficiency or inefficiency differences between 
advanced and emerging markets may also contribute to the results rather than the CB inter the central bank interventions. So any of you want to respond? Mariano, maybe? Sure, my microphone is on, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's a very good question. Um, in our paper, we also look at the liquidity in the bond market as measured by the bid ask spread. And we see huge differences across emerging markets and advanced economies. So the answer is yes, definitely. As a matter of fact, around the COVID related announcements, by COVID related announcement, I mean something like uh, Fauci goes to you know to have a press conference and gives an update about it um, around those announcements the liquidity has improved substantially in advanced economies but actually it has deteriorated substantially in emerging economies so very different view yep okay thank you and i see another question um can I respond to the questions? Um, Mohammed, are you a panelist? Or if you're not a panelist, I think it will be impossible. But if you're uh, uh, participating as a panelist, then you can respond. So um, Mohammed can, I'm, I'm not sure. So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, okay. You were the co-author, I understand, but you weren't, uh, admitted as a panelist, so I'm, I'm afraid uh, you won't be able. Maybe you can type the ans your answer, uh, short answer, and, and I hope the audience can uh, can read your answer. Um, uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much indeed. Oh, here you are. Ah, okay, yeah, discussion. you have yeah, two minutes, think, yeah. <laughs> Great. Some magic happened. Yeah. All right, so. so. Yeah, on the question uh, from the Indonesia and on the emerging markets, yeah, there is connectedness and uh, there was fear. And I think at some point earlier, Tuan did uh, mention that there was International Institute of, uh, I think, fiscal studies. They mentioned that there could be more than 100 billion outflows uh, of capital, which could put pressure on the emerging markets. But in emerging market, I think comparatively, the uh, pandemic was well managed, as we did see in East Asia, particularly uh, China, where it started. Uh, so there wasn't uh, massive uh, capital flows, uh, outflows in those economies. Uh, uh, and well, to be fair, uh, credit could be given the way they manage them. Uh, on the issue of not including the monetary policy uh, into the uh, framework or into the model, uh, well, if we look at the traditional uh, interest rate instrument or policy tools, they were uh, almost... Uh, at zero, well, they're around zero or zero lower bound for a very long time. In, for instance, uh, my own country, UK, uh, we didn't do, uh, we didn't cut uh, rates uh, below zero. They were about 0.5 and we went to 0.1. So there wasn't much easing in terms of our traditional tools. Yes, there were uh, more asset purchases. Uh, that was probably the only option left. Fed did reduce from uh, uh, point, uh, negative 0.4 to negative 0.5, the deposit rates, and Bank, Bank of England reduction was only about uh, uh, 40 basis point. Uh, we did do more quantitative easing. So yeah, there could be maybe a study which could be focused on uh, large, uh, large scale asset purchases and its impact uh, then on the yield. Uh, but for that, obviously, we will have to then use a completely uh, different uh, framework for that. But yeah, that could be, I think, uh, Segal, that could be, we could take it as a suggestion. But I think looking at like what you'll be seeking for, maybe you, you need an extra uh, an, an extra paper for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I missed any question, uh, yeah, I can respond. Uh, I think we have to move on to the next paper. Oh, so thank okay. you everyone, yeah, presenter, good. discussant, and uh, other participants in this uh, interesting discussion. So uh, the second paper on our session is uh, actually a question, central exchanges for government bonds. Well, uh, evidence from the US and Israel during COVID-19 and Daniel Natan from the Bank of Israel will present uh, the paper. So Daniel, the floor is yours for about uh, 20 minutes. Thank you. Uh, can everybody see my slides? Not yet, we see you. Yes, because I didn't share my screen. Uh, 
just a second, sorry. All right. Now we see slide, just move to presentation mode. Yeah, that's great. Okay, please. All right, so let's begin. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, this is a joint paper with Enrico Tai, also from the Bank of Israel, and Milena Witwer. She just graduated from Stanford. And uh, the title is Central Exchanges for Government Bonds. As Sigal uh, said, it's actually a question. So we are also going to try to uh, provide an answer for that. And the background is going to be the COVID-19 uh, crisis that happened in 2020. So uh, let's start from the motivation. So basically, financial markets come in two structures. There are centralized exchange. All traders can trade with you, you know, one another. Uh, you can think about equities. And there's also over-the-counter markets, where investors trade uh, bilaterally with market makers, uh, and they can't uh, trade with each other. That's uh, an important distinction. So which market structure gives rise to the higher liquidity? Uh, a big debate. Uh, in the pro exchange, uh, probably one of the bigger proponents is uh, most, uh, not the bigger, but one of the proponents is uh, Daryl Duffy from Stanford uh, that uh, says that uh, treasuries in the US should be centralized because it can decrease balance sheet constraints and allow other investors to supply liquidity. Uh, in the pro OTC camp, uh, there's actually an uh, emerging literature about uh, uh, the structure that rises in OTC markets, and uh, they find that uh, there are market makers who are, uh, and some of them are very well connected, and they can match buyers and sellers. They charge higher markups, but they're very important that uh, in that they uh, can provide liquidity, especially in a in a crisis such as the COVID nineteen. So, in this paper, we're going to focus on uh, the government bond markets one of the largest uh, benchmark for all, uh, all other assets, typically traded in the uh, OTC uh, markets. And as I said, there's a big policy debate because of the dysfunction of treasuries in March 2020, whether a uh, treasury should uh, reform towards exchanges. So we want to add to that debate. And we're going to ask whether uh, government bonds are more liquid in a crisis when traded on an exchange. So obviously we don't have the counterfactual, but we have something pretty nice uh, and unique, which is the institutional, institutional sorry, feature of the Israeli government bond market, which has an essential exchange. And we're gonna test uh, by how much having an exchange affected the EBITDA spreads, which is going to be our measure of liquidity uh, in March of 2020 uh, via difference in difference analysis. So the main finding is as follows. We find that uh, government data spreads would have been lower uh, with an exchange, uh, about 60% lower. And that's using US data uh, compared to Israel, of course. And uh, one can argue that the US is special. It's a safe haven, not only for US investors, also for investors worldwide. worldwide. So we expand the test for other major economies with OTC markets. And we find that it would have been 50% lower when you look at the UK data and 30% uh, lower uh, when you look at Germany and Japan. So this points uh, to the conclusion that favors market reform. So let me go over the um, relative literature. Um, so actually, I was quite surprised that there's uh, plenty of uh, papers about centralized OTC markets. And uh, we're uh, differ from those that we concentrate on government bond market and we specifically look at a, a liquidity crisis. And there's also some papers that uh, uh, analyze the impact of having a central clearing party. And the central clearing party essentially is that when you have one central clearing party, you have a dealer and you can uh, match a buyer and a seller, you can write it off his balance sheet and then he can provide more liquidity. And in treasuries, you have many central clearing parties and then it uh, inhibits the provision of liquidity. So in our case, uh, we differ from these papers in that, in that we, not only the Israeli exchange has a central clearing party, it also is a centralized exchange where everybody can um, trade with each other. And uh, our third contribution is, well, obviously, as you, as you know, and I'm sure you know, there's plenty of papers who analyze the COVID-19 crisis. But we focus actually not on the, we, we stop our estimation up until the point central banks intervene. We don't wanna um, 
uh, analyze what central banks did or did not do to provide liquidity. We just want to analyze the, the mechanism of the having a central exchange and how that affects liquidity. So we stop right before any intervention by any central bank. So let me just uh, talk a bit about the uh, institutional details. So government bonds, as I said, are typically traded in uh, OTC markets, uh, anywhere but in Israel. And uh, in Israel, they're actually traded in a limit order book on which anyone can trade with anyone. And there's also uh, one central clearing party that uh, clears all trades. Uh, let me just give you a bit of a background on what happened in the COVID-19 crisis and the setup of our, uh, of our um, analysis. So in February of 2020, stock prices fell. In March of uh, 3rd of 2020, the Fed unexpectedly lowers the, the Fed funds rate. And afterwards, what you see is a dash for cash, and mutual fund redemptions, foreign investor re uh, redemptions from uh, treasuries. And you actually see uh, uh, the same in Israel and all over the world uh, to a degree. And um, afterwards, you see basically in treasuries and, uh, and evaporation of liquidity. And we'll refer to that point where the Fed uh, uh, intervenes as the cash shock. For us, it's going to be the post-liquidity shock. And let me show you that in pictures, just for the US and Israel. So what you see here, the dashed lines are uh, stock prices indices, indexed to 100. And blue is Israel, and red is uh, US. You see, as I said, the indices are really going down. Uh, especially after the COVID shock, which is the horizontal dashed line, dotted line, sorry. And uh, the solid lines are the yields. Uh, the US bonds, which are in red, you can see them dropping uh, pretty significantly. And uh, that's partially because of the reduction in interest rates. And you also see the reduction in, uh, of yields in Israel at uh, the same uh, time. And what's interesting is that afterwards, after that shock, yields actually spike up. Uh, which is pretty unusual, and that coincides with the uh, uh, evaporation of liquidity in the U.S. and the uh, some degree of reduction in liquidity in uh, Israeli government bonds. That's the, by the way, the yields are the 10-year nominal yields. So, uh, what's our the data we're looking at? We're looking at beta spreads. That's going to be our measure of liquidity from uh, mid February 2020 until the end of March 2020. Uh, for the U.S., we're going to look at constituents of the S&P 500 index, and for uh, Treasury, we're going to look at benchmark bonds from two to 30 years, all from Bloomberg, the, the beta spread data. And for Israel, we're going to look at the 35 stocks of the largest Israeli companies, also known as the TA35, and all government nominal government bonds with maturity above two years. When we analyze the other countries, we're going to look at the constituents of their leading stock indices and their benchmark bonds as long as they have a maturity of uh, above two years. And as I said, the measure of liquidity is gonna be the beta spread. The ask price minus the bid price, the bid price divided by the midpoint times 100, basically in uh, percent. So this is our main hypothesis, which is that liquidity is higher on the exchange than in the OTC market during a crisis uh, because uh, central clearing, there is the central clearing mechanism that helps absorb counterparty risk, but also because investors can provide liquidity to one another. If dealers are constrained for some reasons, investors can step in and also provide liquidity. So let me show you the raw data of the aggregate beta spreads that we use for the analysis. So what you see here is the time series of, time series of the beta spreads of US stocks and bonds. Uh, in blue is the beta spreads of bonds, and in red is the beta spread in, in stocks. The dashed line is, is the cash shock. That's the third of March. So what you see, all index to 100. Uh, what you see is that uh, both of them uh, start going up uh, mid-February. Uh, and after the cash shock, you see that the beta spread of bonds, uh, basically, there's a, a tremendous rise almost like 12 times uh, the amount. Nothing compared to the rise in the in US stocks. Um, let's see what happened in Israel. So this is the time series of beta spreads of Israeli stocks and bonds. Um, essentially, both move uh, together more or less. 
they rise after the cash shock, but nothing close to uh, what happened in the US. Uh, We'll of course argue that uh, the extra rise in bonds is due to the not them the treasuries don't have a, a central clearing mechanism. So the takeaway that from these uh, figures is that the cash shock affected bond spreads at the same time in both countries, uh, more strongly in the U.S. Uh, in government bonds than in Israeli government bonds, which have an exchange unlike the treasuries. And stock spreads more or less rose uh, similarly in both countries. So what I showed you in pictures, we're gonna do more rigorously in a triple difference in difference analysis. Uh, what you see here is the main specification. The dependent variable is gonna be the log spread, which I showed you for each uh, security. We're gonna have security fixed effects. We're gonna have uh, time fixed effects. Uh, we're going to have an interaction with bond and post. Bond, post is a post, sorry, is a dummy variable for uh, after the, uh, the cash shock. Bond is a dummy variable whether you're in bond, They're essentially allowing uh, bonds to have a, uh, to be affected differently than stocks after the crisis. Interaction between post and IL, uh, allowing a different uh, effect on Israeli. IL is a dummy variable that, uh, that receives the value one if uh, it's an Israeli security. And the main specification is the triple interaction is bond IL post, which is going to measure uh, how much, uh, according to our hypothesis, less uh, Israeli uh, beta spreads uh, were affected than uh, US uh, uh, beta spreads in bonds, in the bonds market. So we uh, expect gamma uh, right here to be negative. Now, uh, when you uh, perform a difference in difference analysis, of course, you have to show that the parallel trend assumption uh, is there, the pre-parallel trend. And uh, there's also a, a more uh, important uh, assumption that we're making here, which I wanna, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you an intuition of how I uh, see it. So one can uh, perform a difference in difference analysis and look at just the uh, US bonds and US stocks. And US bonds and US stocks are different kinds of animals. And, and the liquidity shock would affect them differently. Uh, to which extent, unclear. And then there's the extra effect because uh, bonds have uh, no central exchange. So it's affected by two parameters. The, when we want to analyze the second parameter, which is the extent that uh, the effect on bonds was higher because uh, bonds uh, in the US don't have a central uh, clear mechanism. So in order to isolate this second part, one could look at Israel. And in Israel, there was also a liquidity shock, as I showed you, uh, also a dash for cash, uh, a shortage of liquidity. So it affected bond and stocks uh, differently because uh, as in the US, and then you don't have that extra parameter, which is the effect on the Israeli bonds because they don't uh, trade on an, uh, on an exchange. So when you do the triple difference in difference, you basically, you can isolate that extra parameter, which is that gamma variable. And in words is, I also made here an, uh, an assumption, if you notice that any effect that, the, which is written here in the last bullet, that any effect that the cash shock had on the bond stock difference that was unrelated to the trading mechanism was the same on both countries. So basically, in my example, I assume that uh, that liquidity shock that affected uh, bonds and stock differently in the US uh, and in Israel was, was similar, uh, which is a strong assumption, but we think it's a reasonable assumption uh, because of our uh, short uh, time frame of this uh, analysis. So, now I'm gonna show you the results of this gamma parameter. Instead of showing you the table, which just estimates the pre and post effect, I'm gonna show you something better. I'm gonna show you the uh, dynamic analog of the, of the estimation. So what you see here is the dynamic uh, truthful difference in difference. Uh, the gamma here is basically a dummy variable for every, there's plenty of gammas here to show you the effect uh, on any date. And the 24th of February is the reference point. Uh, so what's important here to see that uh, vertical line is the uh, cash shock. What's important here to notice is that that gamma is essentially not different from zero before the cash shock. That's the parallel uh, trend assumption. So there's nothing going on before. 
and you see that gamma uh, going down right after the cash shock and uh, statistically significant and zero uh, negative. And it's also important to notice here that um, um, it's negative for all the sample after the post crisis shock. So the results are not drif uh, driven by any outliers. And when we do the estimation, uh, this is the whole estimation with the pre uh, and post data. The, uh, there's a pooled OLS uh, specification and the fixed effect specification. Uh, the gamma is minus uh, 0 0.95, about 0 0.95 minus 0 0.95. Uh, these are log spreads. They don't uh, easily translate to changes in spread. So I'm just gonna tell you that it translate to a reduction of uh, 60% uh, in the beta spread. Now, uh, as I said in the, in the introduction, one can argue that uh, treasuries are special. And, uh, that, and in my story that I told you regarding the intuition that uh, the extra effect on US bonds was only due to the, them having central query. But it could be that there's something else, another parameter that's going on due to the specialness of treasuries. So uh, in order to check that, we'll, we can also look at other countries that have OTC markets, uh, such as the UK, which I'm showing you here. And this is the dynamic analysis that I showed you for the US, just for the UK. What you see here is before the shock, the shock is the same in the 3rd of March, indistinguishable from, indistinguishable from zero, and there's a reduction just as the US. Now here it's going up, towards the end it's going up, but we're gonna cut our estimation right here, not because it's convenient, but it is convenient, but not only because it's convenient, it's because uh, uh, the Central Bank of uh, England started intervening right about here. So we don't wanna, uh, we don't wanna, in our paper, we're trying to just uh, estimate the, um, the effect of having a central clear mechanism, not the effect of central bank intervening and how it, that affected uh, the liquidity. Um, so keep that in mind. So in, for Germany, we see the same thing and no parallel trend, a reduction. Again, also for Germany, we're gonna cut right about here because the ECB started intervening uh, right about there. And uh, the same for Japan. Japan also has an OTC market. Their central bank started interviewing on the 11th of March, started buying uh, government bonds. Uh, right about where you see that uh, uh, upward trend. So uh, all of these results lead to uh, showing that uh, it's about uh, not having a, a central exchange. And I'll show you, this is the a table where, we, where I'll show you all the, the US and all the other countries, the UK, Japan, and uh, Germany in a fixed effect estimation uh, for comparison. And this, in this comparison, it's only uh, up to, uh, they're all estimated right now in the same post-crisis period, just for comparison's sake. And uh, you see that in the US with that minus 0.95 that we that I showed you before. And just let, as I said, it's not easily translatable. Just let me show you this uh, uh, slide. So essentially it is 61% when you use US data, 50% when you use UK data and 30% when you use J Japanese and uh, German data. Uh, so, Yes, in, uh, in, in the US is the largest. So these results do su support the notion that uh, there's also an extra parameter, uh, not necessarily because everything here has a, you know, has a statistical uh, uh, confidence bounds. And it might be that we can rule out that they all have the same effect, but it does point out that, uh, that maybe there is something special going on in the US. But uh, having said that, it's very large with uh, using uh, UK data and also Japan and Germany. So I'm about to conclude. So we analyze whether having an exchange for government bonds can foster liquidity. And we use the, the unique uh, institutional features of uh, Israel. And uh, the descriptive uh, the evidence suggests that having an exchange may foster liquidity. And uh, the difference in difference analysis uh, provides supporting evidence for this hypothesis. So all the findings favor the idea of introducing exchanges uh, for governing bonds. That's the bottom line of uh, this whole uh, paper and the question mark for the title, which is uh, we say yes for reform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle.
Uh, we'll have uh, the discussant now, Sebastian Infante from the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, so please. Uh, great. Uh, I hope everybody can uh, see my slides and hear me well. Yeah, we hear okay. you and we see you. Great. And your Thanks. slides. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks for the opportunity for letting me talk about this uh, very timely and interesting paper about uh, central exchanges and government bonds. <clears throat> I have to say I'm affiliated with the Federal Reserve Board. So for this particular topic, it's, it's important for me to recognize that these are just my views. Nobody else on the Federal Reserve uh, Board or anybody with the system. Um, uh, it, these are not their views, it's just mine. So uh, I don't really have to motivate the talk uh, or the paper rather, uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, everybody in the audience probably knows there was a huge uh, market turmoil in bond markets in March, 2020 that uh, prompted a massive uh, public sector response. Uh, monetary, monetary policy easing in the United States, expansion of repo programs, asset purchases, and introduction of swap lines for, for dollar funding across the world. And obviously, since then, uh, the main uh, topic has been, you know, it, it, was, it kind of caught people by surprise that the most, the deepest and most liquid market in the world had these problems. Um, so therefore, you know, there's been many proposals to, to improve government bottom resiliency. The first one is, you know, improvements in firms internal risk, uh, risk controls and risk management. Others are uh, regarding revisiting regulatory uh, initiatives that, you know, Make, make bank may make bank balance sheets much more inelastic than what they should be. And, and finally, which is the topic of this paper, which is the expanded uh, clearing of, of, of government bonds. And so, uh, so the open question I think is, would central clearing have alleviated the market of liquidity in the United States? And sort of this paper is trying to speak to that. Um, and, and it's an incredibly important policy question and, and sort of uh, and, and so I, I applaud the authors to tackle this question. Um, and, and so what do the authors do? Well, effectively, they just compare bid and ask spreads across uh, stocks and bond markets in jurisdictions with and without government uh, clearing, uh, bond market clearing, that is, you know, Israel versus US and others. Um, I'm gonna, uh, and sort of a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, Daniel did a really good job in, you know, explaining what, what, whatever, what, what they did, but I mean, this sort of just, highlights what's going on. This is the loading on sort of the relative illiquidity of Israel after of Israeli bond market rather after the shock. And you see that, you know, it's much more liquid, right? And, and so the, the, the paper claims, okay, this is, is, is evidence that, you know, central clearing would have had a massive effect and then do some back of the envelope calculations of what this would translate to. So, um, just to give you an overview of, of, of my thoughts or my comments today, it, it's an incredibly nice, uh, convincing empirical exercise. I think the authors do a really, uh, it, I have nothing to quibble about with the empirics nor the strategy. I, I think it's perfectly fine. Um, and, and they convincingly showed that the illiquidity in the US government bond markets was much worse than the Israeli gone, uh, bond markets in relative terms relative to stocks. So uh, I have a lot to say about this and uh, very little time to, uh, to say all of it. So Sigal, please keep me uh, uh, disciplined. Um, but um, effectively, my main concerns are really convincing readers that these, these differences that they're documenting in liquidity are really driven by central clearing. And sort of my remarks, are, are, I'm basically going to start with sort of just an issue about nomenclature and sort of the conceptual benefits of clearing. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of financing. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about the severity of the COVID shock in Israeli government bond markets, um, which you know Daniel spoke, spoke a little bit about, but I, I want to put a little bit more color. And then sort of just a more technical thing that if I have a chance, you know, uh, maybe take a look at off the run treasuries, which, which apparently were, were, were the asset class that were much more in distress. So overall, it, it, my, 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 all, my, all these comments are geared to saying that, look, understanding the mechanism is importantly, is, is critically important for the correct policy prescription. You cannot walk into a policymaker and say, look, it's more liquid, less liquid, it's gotta be this. So I think uh, the paper could improve a lot by just sort of unpacking how this is working and, 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 and that would be a much more convincing argument. So, um, what are the benefits of clearing in the cash market? By cash market, I mean buying and selling uh, securities. Well, 
It's important to recognize that there is a difference between central clearing and all to all trading. And in the paper, I wasn't entirely sure what the authors were trying to say that central clearing was solving, right? Sometimes it was seemed that they could trade with anybody. Others, it was, it, it was directly about clearing. So, I mean, there are examples of centrally clear markets that aren't all to all trading. The largest that I can think of is the DVP bilateral repo market. Contracts are, turn, are, are, are negotiated bilaterally and then finally novated the FIC. And so is the mechanism that the authors have in mind related to clearing or all-to-all -all trading? I, I, I urge them to be more precise about that. So if it is about central clearing, then why do, why do we think this is good? Well, effectively, it reduces the settlement risk between buyers and sellers. That is, I know I'm going to get paid or I'm going to receive the securities tomorrow. And importantly, this doesn't affect dealers' capacity to remediate securities, right? And so the idea is that if a dealer has to clear for its clients, it's effectively creating payables and receivables in his balance sheet, grossing up its size, and this may be you know, undesirable. So this is sort of the idea that many of the proponents, in particular Daryl Duffy, has noted that, look, issuance has gone up, balance sheet allocation is, is stayed constant, and this uh, in a, in a inelasticity, if you will, is effectively what, ca what caused the problem. So... It's still an open question whether how large the central clearing issue was. Um, there's a paper by the DTCC that says it kind of wasn't that big. Um, uh, or and, and sort of, I, I think that there's a lot of more work that needs to be done to sort of qualify how important this was for actually dealers. So my suggestion is be very specific about the friction you have in mind. And if it's clearing, you, uh, I would ask that please characterize a little bit more about how banks in Israel face these frictions and you know how does that contrast to the US market so i think just setting the stage and clarifying the issue would you know make make the the paper's argument way more convincing now the second issue i want to talk about is sort of a pet peeve of mine those who know me um, it's about like securities financing transactions which is just a fancy word for saying repo now you could think that there was an alternative channel happening here that effectively it wasn't that dealers weren't willing to buy and sell. It was that dealers weren't willing to lend to levered investors, right? And so lending in the secured and in a reverse repo unequivocally increases your balance sheet. And so here I have a little plot from, from a paper I have with a co-author at the board. On the left, it's a lot of a lot's going on, but on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the red line is the total amount of financing for dealers' positions. The black line is the total amount of financing for other counterparties. Now you can see both of these went up. So you know my there were the dealers were lending to others. Note this difference in scale, by the way. But if you take the ratio, or if you think about total funding relative to how much they did to finance their positions, it sharply decreased. And this is red line here. So this suggests that while dealers were buying and lending, their lending to levered investors wasn't commensurate to their buying, right? And this, you know, if, if, if you think that the end investors are a hedge fund, then they, they really rely on this to put on these trades and effectively they couldn't get their funding and this was, you know, part of the market of liquidity. So, um, so put into the context of the paper, there's previous literature that has highlighted the impact of financing on central clearing. I really like this, this paper that studies the New York Stock Exchange and really says, you know, financing was a big part of it. Now, I recognize that you know a lot of people have said that the solution is clearing. Uh, in particular, you know, Daryl. I used to be a student of Daryl, and I know how treacherous it is. How treacherous it is to uh, disagree with him because uh, he's often right. And so I'm not saying that central clearing uh, of cash trades is is isn't good. In fact, it is a precursor to central clearing of repos. And sort of, I just want uh, the, the issue is that if my suggestion for the paper is that. If we really want to talk about, um, you know, the issue of central clearing, I would take a more broader view and include also the securities financing markets um, and, and sort of discuss how they may differ in, in, in Israel and, and, and the U.S. My final sort of uh, my next big comment is sort of to understand a little bit what the economic magnitude of the COVID shock in, in Israeli bond markets were. So the COVID shock was just, you know, one directional trading. Everybody just wanted to monetize securities. And sort of this is a figure by Hay, Nagel, and Song that, sorry, that scale's a little small, but just eyeballing this, you see that in March or in Q1, adding all this together, you have nearly half a trillion in selling volumes. It's enormous. It's enormous, right? And sort of 
And when and so in the paper, the authors do put sort of a, a, a figure of like selling of institutional investors of uh, Israeli financial markets, and 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 they 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 document it's about if I did the the math right, it's about one billion dollars in order flows, right? And so, okay, you can't compare the U.S. to uh, to the Israeli market, you know, have a trillion and what, but one billion are are are, are very different, and sort of. And after just a quick Googling, I'm just realized I, I just did this uh, this morning. You know, um, I found a, a news article that sort of the Bank of Israel expanded its use of dollar swaps um, on the 18th of March uh, to 15 billion dollars. So this, so 15 billion dollars. This means that there was also a dollar funding shortage in the Israeli uh, market, right? And so. How do Israeli institutional investors manage your liquidity? Do they sell first their Israeli bonds? Do they sell their, 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 their more liquid, perhaps reserve currency bonds? Or you could think of you know, uh, German boons or, or you know, uh, uh, liabilities from, uh, from Japan. And so it, it would be important to put these sort of magnitudes into context. How large was the shock relative to other places, A, and B, how did Israeli institutional investors react to this shock? And, and, and sort of, you know, this, this, this increase of swap lines um, uh, of the Bank of Israel sort of is indicative that there was a problem in dollar funding and it was 15 billion relative to 1 billion that's documented in the paper. So I think it's very important to quantify this economic magnitude rather than just showing different jurisdictions because as the previous paper also noted that, you know, emerging markets and, 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 and um, advanced economies um, uh, reacted very differently. Finally, uh, just you know, how you measure liquidity in the U.S. Treasury market. This is a challenging thing. The authors focus on the on the run Treasury, um, and you know, but reportedly a lot of the uh, pressures were on the off the run uh, paper. Effectively, they were sort of investors trying to monetize their their, their reserves, and, and sort of while the on the Treasury is typically the most liquid, you know that by you know theoretical work and empirical work by Anand Vale is one. You know, um, when you're thinking about sort of uh, liquidity in this market, you also have to think about the financing part, right? And sort of the all-in cost is the levered cost. So how was liquidity in the repo market is also sort of something that you have to bring into bear. And sort of the value, I have a paper with this with a colleague, but I, uh, yes or who, but also, you know, Christian Murthy sort of makes old bond, new bond sort of comparison and sort of to actually calculate the P&L or the differences rather of these pricing, you have to incorporate the financing costs and sort of, um, this is just all to say that, that, that maybe focusing on off-the-run treasuries would, uh, might be better because, you know, the repo frictions aren't that big in the off-the-run treasury, presumably. And, and also sort of, uh, it seems that that was where the, the largest uh, impact was. So I did, act, I hope I was actually on time. Um, so just to, to wrap up, this is a very interesting and robust, uh, robust study of differential equity uh, conditions across markets, incredibly convincing. Uh, I buy it. Uh, I like it. it it's uh, it's really great. But um, I think that if you wanted to convince people it was really about central clearing, you have to do a few things. You know, first of all, how characterize how central clearing plays a role in this market? Is it all to all, or is it you know clearing? Describe funding conditions. Quantify economic uh, significance. And finally, these are these are not just. I mean, I, I'm coming to this also with you know a policy uh, from a policy institution hat that you know if I walked into you know, a, a principal's office, and I said, we have to do all to all clearing, you know, you, it, you have to be very, very convincing, right? And, and, and it's not just, you know, these differences in prices, and, and sort of, it, I, I think the paper would, would be much more impactful, if, if it could make some progress in these dimensions. Um, but yeah, so please keep going. And, and I'm looking forward to, to reading um, future versions of it. So uh, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Sebastian, you were on time. And uh, thank you for this very elaborate uh, discussion. Uh, any other questions from other participants on the Q&A? And panelists can just uh, talk, ask anything, anything else from anyone? Uh, Danielle or any of the other co-authors want to respond? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the, um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So thanks, uh, Sebastian, for your uh, for the time to discuss this paper. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to say regarding the off the the off the run uh, treasuries, we considered doing it. It's just that we knew that there the the situation was much uh, actually worse, and that would have actually shown that uh, central clearing or all to all. Uh, uh, like you said, we have to be more specific in what we mean here, that the, the effect is actually stronger. We didn't want to show that the effect is so strong. So people will, would say, no, it's just because you showed me illiquid uh, off the run treasure. For sure, we're gonna add that in uh, future versions. Um, like you said, we have to be more specific in what's going on in Israel and uh, institutional details. Actually, in Israel, there's no repo market for uh, treasury uh, for government bonds. Um, um, so, but uh, we'll have to address all the excellent um, questions you raised. And thanks again. Thank you, Daniel. Anyone else? Some additional comments or questions? I don't see anything on the Q&A. Okay, so let's move on to our third and final uh, paper. The third paper is uh, uh, moving from uh, government bonds to corporate bonds, corporate bond liquidity during the COVID-19 crisis. And Mahyar Kargar from the University of Illinois will be uh, presenting many co-authors. I won't uh, uh, say them all, but maybe you you can. Uh, I will, I will. Can you guys hear okay. me? And so please, thank screen? you. Can you guys see my screen? And... Yes, yes, we can see this, oh. the presentation and yourself. Great, thank you. Thank you for, so much for putting the paper on the program. This is joint work with uh, Ben Lesser at the Philly Fed, Shu Liu at the Xinhua University, uh, and uh, David Lindsay, uh, Diego Zuniga, and Pierre Olivier Weil from UCLA. Uh, again, because this is a Fed paper, uh, the usual Fed disclaimer applies. So, I mean, I don't have to convince this audience, but uh, we know the corporate bond market during March 2020 was basically under a huge amount of distress uh, measured by credit spreads going to the roof, Con customer to dealer volume increased by about 50%, and there was a massive outflows from bond mutual funds. So in response, uh, Fed announced unprecedented precedented actions in late March. So it revived uh, on March 17, the primary dealer credit facility, allowing dealers uh, basically to borrow against a variety of collateral, including corporate bonds and even equity, and more importantly, it announced for the first time that it would buy corporate bonds uh, and ETFs in the primary and secondary market through these uh, two PMCCF and SMCCF credit, corporate credit facilities. Uh, and so what do we do in the paper? We back, basically study liquidity conditions during the crisis and also the aftermath of these uh, Fed interventions. So given this uh, exogenous nature of these COVID-19 shocks that we observed, and importantly, setting, it was set against a backdrop of a well-capitalized financial uh, sector post the global financial crisis, this provides us a unique opportunity to study how uh, corporate bond dealers actually responded to a massive uh, uh, exogenous surge in selling pressure. So important for uh, our approach in assessing uh, market liquidity is to consider both cost and quality or speed up intermediation services. So you can imagine the liquidity uh, could deteriorate in multiple channels. Uh, customers could actually pay higher costs or wait longer for the trade to be executed. We consider actually both of these dimensions in our, in our analysis. And then we write down a simple model that allows us to disentangle two uh, widely cited but not mutually exclusive source of liquidity. One is a so-called dash for cash, a large increase in customers' demand for immediacy. And the second one is a decrease in uh, dealers willing to supply immediacy by putting bonds on their own balance sheets. And then finally, we talk about uh, the implications of uh, Fed intervention as also this like illiquidity on customers uh, basically evolved. So in case I run out of time, I'm gonna give you a preview of our main findings. So what we find is that despite this uh, massive selling pressure, dealers are actually reluctant to absorb bonds onto their balance sheets. So how do we see this? We see that the cost of uh, so-called risky principle, fast trades in which dealers use their own balance sheet to intermediate in the corporate bond market went up dramatically by almost a factor of 10. So in response, uh, customers actually shifted towards a slower so-called agency trades. And we see the fraction of these trades during the height of the crisis went up by as much as uh, 15 percentage points. And what's, what's most striking for us is that during the height of the crisis, uh, dealers that were supposed to uh, 
lean against the wind, not only they didn't do that, they actually became net sellers, a completely uh, 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 dramatic, uh, uh, basically, incident. So only after Fed intervened, we see some significant improvement in the liquidity conditions in the corporate bond market. We see immediately after announcement, eligible bonds for the SMCCF uh, show improvement in liquidity. And later after these programs were expanded in size and scope, we see actually for the wide variety of bonds, liquidity improved. And then as a result, also dealer began in mediation in the corporate bond market. So we actually uh, use the uh, uh, exploit the eligibility criteria for the, this program to actually identify the causal impact of that intervention on the corporate bond market. So we actually, as I said, write down a model and using our model, we can estimate uh, uh, diff these two different shocks. Specifically, we're gonna estimate the, uh, our model and show that uh, as you expect, there's was like a huge increase in demand for immediacy. And this so-called dash for cash was a cr crucial source of illiquidity uh, during the crisis. And we actually estimate that the willingness to pay for a unit of infra marginal risky principal trade went up by as much as 200 basis points during the crisis. And uh, importantly, in order to, for us to rationalize what we observed in the market in terms of prices and quantity, uh, quantities, we need to also have a shock to dealers cost of supplying this immediacy. So demand shocks by itself is not going to be, are not going to be enough. Uh, so also this provides us, uh, this are uh, the behavior, looking at the behavior, this, this demand shocks and also uh, the price premium that customers paid for uh, these uh, so-called immediate risky principal trade, uh, looking at that uh, and then looking at that uh, with the timeline of Fed interventions, uh, allows us to have a better uh, sense of uh, what actually happened, the channels through which Fed intervention actually uh, improved market liquidity. We, we see that the demand shocks receded almost immediately uh, post Fed interventions, but the supply shock actually lingered even after uh, Fed uh, began buying corporate bonds. And then uh, we have, as, as I mentioned, implication for the co customer's uh, well being and surplus from immediacy. We see that the surplus from immediacy clearly obviously declined during the height of the crisis, but the decline was less pronounced than the massive increase in the relative price premium. Why? Because there was an increase in uh, customers' uh, demand for uh, immediacy. But again, we see that also it, it remained suppressed well after market calm because of this uh, uh, migration uh, towards the low quality agents. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the literature and, and jump right into the, in the paper. So as I mentioned, there are two types of uh, uh, transaction services that we're gonna actually look into because we look at both co cost and quality of intermediation services. One is so-called agency trades, uh, which in these types of trades, customer seller actually re uh, re uh, has the possession of the asset uh, when it contacts the dealer and dealer only, uh, uh, the transaction only happens when dealer finds a suitable counterparty, a customer buyer. So customer uh, uh, maintains the position of the asset. So for the perspective of a customer that cares about immediacy, these are low quality trades. And for the, from the perspective of a dealer that uh, cares about balance sheet space, these are low cost transaction because dealer just acts as a matchmaker. The other type is so-called risky principal trade in which customer trades immediately against the dealer balance sheet and ba dealer buys it immediately and puts it on its own balance sheet. So again, high quality for the customer because they're immediate high cost for the dealer because they use balance sheet space. So we use the data from uh, the corporate bond market from Trace uh, in order to build a time series of uh, transaction costs for these two types of uh, trades. And you see the time series in the graph. The red is the time series of uh, risky principal high quality trades. Blue is the uh, agency low quality trades and the uh, green is the difference between the two. So we see pre-crisis, uh, the risky principal transaction cost was around 25 basis point, and the agency trade transaction cost was around eight. So it was still higher uh, for the risky principal trade. During the crisis, we see dramatic increase in the cost of risky principal trades by almost a factor of 10, much more modest for agency trades. And after Fed intervention, uh, around March 23rd and March 18, we see the transaction costs start going down. But again, we're not back to uh, pre-pandemic levels. Again, and we do this much more carefully also in regression with fixed effects, but in terms of, the, of time, I refer you to the paper. So as a result, uh, customers actually substituted towards uh, these low quality trades because the cost of high quality trades went up by 
uh, a factor of 10. So we see uh, the fraction of agency trades by number in uh, blue and by volume in red, we see that during the height of the crisis, the fraction of agency trades by volume went up by as much as uh, 15 percentage points. So I talked about dealer inventories. This plots the uh, accumulative inventory of uh, corporate bond dealers, again, from uh, data uh, through FINRA from Trace. So if you focus on the crisis period from March 5th to around March 18, we see not only dealers did not lean against the wind, actually they became net sellers uh, of corporate bonds, despite this massive uh, selling pressure that customers have. And we, only, we see only after Fed intervention uh, on March 18 and, and subsequently on March 23rd, we see dealers started accumulating inventories. Actually, we see from March 18 to almost June uh, to June 15, they actually accumulated almost $50 billion worth of corporate bonds. So if you look at the data from flow of funds, you see basically almost doubled their inventory during this uh, uh, next couple of months, during this uh, few months. So what I did, uh, so it's a summary so far, we see price of uh, high quality trades went up, price of agent, agency, uh, agency low quality trades went up by much, by much less. There was a shift towards a low quality trades and dealers absorbed no inventory on net and they started absorbing after uh, Fed interventions. So I showed you some uh, suggestive evidence that Fed intervention actually helped uh, improve the market liquidity. Now I want to be actually more careful and kind of identify the Fed uh, intervention impact, uh, exploiting the differences uh, in, in eligibility criteria for the SMCCF. So on March 23rd, Fed announced that it would buy US corporate bonds that have investment grade rating and have remaining maturity of five years or less. And there were some other criteria. So the question that we have is, did the intervention improve uh, bond market liquidity for eligible bonds relative to ineligible bonds or not? Empirical strategy is a uh, difference in differences uh, using US bonds before and after the SMCCF announcement. So this is just like a standard diff and diff. Uh, so the dependent variable is the transaction cost of bond I on day T and J is just the type of transaction, either agency, low quality, or a risky principal, high quality. So eligible is a dummy for uh, bonds that have investment grade rating and time to maturity of less than five years. SMCCF is a dummy for uh, the period from March 23rd, right up to April 9th. And we have a bunch of controls uh, like amount outstanding and, uh, and other things. You only focus on bonds that did not change uh, rating from IG to high yield, not to contaminate control and, and, and treatment groups and focus on trades before the April 9 uh, expansion to a so-called fallen angel. Then we have a uh, size category and uh, industry fixed effects. So this table shows you the, the main uh, diff and diff result. If you focus on the uh, first two columns, we see that Fed intervention led to a, a decrease in the cost of risky principal eligible bonds relative to, in it, relative to in it, ineligible bonds. And the magnitude of the effect uh, is around 50 uh, basis points. So we see that, uh, uh, the SMCCF uh, uh, coefficient is actually insignificant. It's an indication that uh, during this period, there was no spillover to ineligible bonds, but obviously after uh, Fed started uh, expanding the program to uh, falling angels and subsequently after it started buying, we see obviously spillover to uh, other type of ineligible bonds. Focusing on the third and fourth column, we also see that the uh, transaction costs for agency trades, those low quality trades for eligible bonds also declined by around 10 basis points. And our explanation is that just the fact that Fed intervened uh, basically reduced the risk of owning these bonds by uh, private investors. So made it easier for dealers to locate because remember dealers are matchmakers in these type of bonds, made it easier for dealers to locate uh, these uh, customer buyers to uh, intermediate this agency trade. So we have a lot more uh, in the paper. We do a lot of robustness, but in the interest of time, I'm going to refer you again to the paper. So, so what I showed you that during this uh, episode, uh, there was a massive uh, uh, liquidity for the corporate bond during the uh, for the corporate bond market that partially reversed by uh, interventions from the Fed. So, but there are a bunch of unanswered questions. So. One of them is like, what are the nature of these shocks that led to this uh, lack of liquidity? And why did the uh, Fed's action improve liquidity so quickly, but not completely, as I showed you from transaction costs, for example? So given these two types of shocks that I mentioned to you, did Fed policy announcement and the further implementation led to 
ease of the so-called dash for cash or ease of dealers balance sheet and risk concerns uh, that uh, we uh, all uh, think about. And how these shocks and intervention affect customers' well-being. So we're going to actually think about the way to answer this question. We're going to write down a simple equilibrium model uh, and then do some structural analysis that allows, uh, allows us to answer these questions. So uh, we have uh, uh, basically n measure n of customers. Each customer has a unit demand for transaction uh, that come in two types. Uh, there are low quality transactions meant to capture those agency trades, and there are high quality transactions, again, meant to capture those risky principal trades. So they maximize the utility by choosing the fraction of uh, risky principal trades, X sub L, and uh, sorry, X sub H, and agency trades, X sub L, subject to uh, demanding a unit uh, transaction. So this theta in this, in this uh, utility function captures the time variation in customers' utility from up, for upgrading from low quality into high quality agency trades. So on the other side of the, the market, there is a representative competitive dealer that supplies its transaction services subject to a, a convex increasing uh, uh, cost function C, which meant to represent a dealer balance sheet uh, constraints or what have you. Uh, and then we have like a uh, market clearing, which is pretty, pretty standard. So we're using the FOC from first order condition from uh, the consumer's problem and the fact that the, the total transactions have to add up to one. So we can write down the inverse demand for immediacy for customers. So basically relating the, the price premium from upgrading from uh, low quality to high quality trades to the margin utility of upgrading from high to low quality, low to high quality. So we see uh, clear in this equation that theta is basically representing a demand shock and uh, generates parallel shift to the inverse, inverse demand curve. Again, using FOC of dealers, market clearing, and also the fact that uh, the total uh, demand is equal to one unit of transaction, we can relate again the price premium to uh, the marginal cost, and this is basically uh, the supply uh, of immediacy. This is just like a simple illustration. Uh, basically, shows you this uh, this graph on the left shows you that uh, these uh, uh, relative demand shocks for uh, high uh, quality trades, these theta shocks, lead to the uh, move uh, of the demand, but not the supply curve. So increasing theta moves the demand curve. Uh, to the right uh, leads to an increase in the price premium as well as increase in the fraction of uh, risky principal trades. Uh, also, uh, total volume of uh, customer dealer transactions represented by N uh, has no effect on individual customers' relative demand for these high quality trades but leads to an increase uh, in the marginal cost of dealers and providing these uh, uh, high quality trades basically leads to a supply shift, a relative supply shift from the right side. You see the supply shifts to the left, leading to an increase in both the price premium as well as the fraction of uh, risky principal uh, and the reduction, sorry, in the, in the fraction of risky principal trades, X sub H. So what do we actually observe? As I showed you earlier, we observe an increase in the price premium, but a decrease in the fraction XH. As I showed you, there was a, actually migration towards the low quality trades. So there was a decrease in the fraction of high quality trades. So this is indicative of a supply shock, as I just showed you. Uh, and that we have some evidence, like for example, as I showed, I, as I discussed earlier, the customer to dealer volume actually goes up around 50% relative to the pre-crisis period. But it doesn't, it doesn't rule out a demand shock. So what do we do is, in order for us to identify demand shocks, we make a parameter, uh, parametric assumption. So we assume that uh, uh, there's a lot logit demand, which is like a reasonable assumption in this market with differentiated products. And we can write down uh, the inverse demand uh, for uh, high quality transaction services as just like a log linear uh, formulation as, as you see in the slides. So, and then we use uh, in instrumental variables to actually estimate this like semi-elasticity parameter sigma uh, using the demand shock out, demand shocks outside uh, the crisis period. So we have a, a, a few different ways of estimating a sigma using different uh, methodologies. We all 
uh, all of them actually lead to same uh, very similar uh, values for this uh, semi elasticity term. So as I mentioned, use the, uh, the supply shocks outside the crisis period, estimate the demand curve, right? We get the, the sigma, then using the demand curve, uh, in the crisis period, we decompose the price premium and the fraction of agency trades into movements along the demand curve due to the, the supply, the, the end shocks, and uh, due to shifts of the demand curve due to the theta shocks. And as you see, this, this approach basically is independent of the shape of the supply curve. So we are agnostic about the shape of the supply curve, but uh, we can actually using our methodology to estimate the actual demand. And after we have that, we can basically use this equation to figure out what theta is, like figure out what the demand shocks are. This is how it looks like. This is our estimated uh, relative demand shocks for risky principal trades. And uh, this is the change relative to uh, the value of theta in January uh, 2nd, 2020. We see, as you expect, there's a massive increase uh, in the uh, a demand for relative demand for risk of principal trades, a high quality trades during the crisis. So we see the M from marginal uh, uh, demand went up by about 250, uh, 200 basis points during the crisis. And then post intervention, it receded pretty much uh, immediately. So as I mentioned, there's a 200 basis point increase in late, uh, late March that receded uh, quickly after Fed announcement. So a natural benchmark to think about is what if supply is perfectly inelastic? So this gives you basically an upper bound on the impact of uh, these uh, demand shocks or a lower bond on the impact of the supply shock of the liquid uh, on the liquidity. So if you, if you assume, for example, to just give you some uh, a benchmark uh, in your head. So if you assume that the supply curve is perfectly uh, inelastic, so it turns out that approximately 75% of the increase in the price premium during the crisis can be explained by this uh, so-called dash for cash. But importantly, as I mentioned to you, demand shock by itself, by themselves cannot generate uh, what we observe in the data. Actually, they generate counterfactual increase in XH in the fraction of risky principal trades. What we observe actually decrease in, in the fraction of risky principal trades. So this tells us that it must be also negative supply shock to dealers at balance sheet in order to, for us to uh, uh, be able to rationalize what we see in the data. So again, after uh, looking at the behavior of the shocks, as well as the price premium and the fraction of agency trades and risky principal trades, against the timeline of Fed intervention allows us to gain some insight into the channels through which uh, policy actually impacted liquidity. So we see that Fed announcement uh, was enough to halt basically the, this dash for cash. And in fact, turns out that uh, this uh, uh, Fed intervention is actually more pronounced for eligible bonds for the SMCCF versus uh, ineligible bonds. It gives you some comfort that actually it's also in, in, in the data. But the thing is it does not, Fed intervention does not decrease the fraction of uh, risky principal trades. Actually turns out it slightly increased that the fraction of risky principal trades it slightly increases so which basically tells you that the announcement uh, eased the supply, uh, supply shocks, um, led to a shift of the supply curve to the right, uh, and that led dealers to absorb more inventory, as I showed you uh, earlier. But the fact that the price premium and the fraction of agency trades still remain elevated post uh, Fed intervention uh, tells us that the supply curve did not actually return to its, its pre-crisis levels, we can have multiple explanations for the reason why that didn't happen. You could uh, think about the anticipated higher volume. You can think about expected future price decline or volatility or other explanation. We're again agnostic about, about this in the paper. So finally, we're going to think about the, using our, 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 our model uh, as well as uh, the, the data, the fraction of agency trades and the price premium. We're going to think about the net utility from, uh, for a customer from upgrading from the low quality agency to the high quality risky principal trades. So we can write down what we call a consumer as surplus from immediacy per dollar of transaction as, as the following uh, uh, formula, as you see in the slide. So you see it depends on the demand shock and clearly also depends on the fraction of uh, agency and risky principal trades. With our logit specification, we can simply write down the change in a surplus as, again, as, uh, as a lock function. 
And it, this allows us to quantify the effect of shocks and Fed policies on this uh, surplus for immediacy. So we can actually plot the, uh, this uh, SH minus H80 again relative to the uh, value of the surplus on uh, January 2nd, 2020. So uh, this is how this is how that looks like. So again, not surprisingly, we see a decline during the during the uh, height of the crisis. But importantly, this decline is a lot less uh, severe than the increase in the price premium. The reason is that there was also a massive increase in the demand for uh, this high quality trades that partially offsets this uh, decline in surplus. But again, as you see post intervention, uh, uh, you see still the surplus from VC is around 10 basis point lower than the pre-crisis period. Why could that be? Again, because now the basket of uh, customers on average has a uh, lower quality because of this uh, migration towards uh, the lower quality transactions. So let me conclude. Uh, so I showed you that during the height of the crisis, dealers absorbed no additional inventory and became actually net sellers. The cost to investors of trading immediately uh, with the dealers surged uh, quite dramatically. And as a result, investors substituted towards less costly uh, so-called agency trades. After Fed announcement, liquidity immediately improved for eligible bonds and also for a wide, uh, wide variety of bonds post-expansion and a dealer bond inventory search. We write down a model and estimate uh, basically the relative demand shocks, confirm that was a big increase in this uh, demand for immediacy. And also we see uh, also a simul we should, there should be a simultaneous increase in the supply shock as well, which uh, uh, add also had also impact on the customer surplus for immediate. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we can move now to the discussant, Bo Becker from Stockholm School of Economics. Bo, please. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers for having me uh, discuss this very interesting paper. Let me see if I can show up. As a yeah, we see, we see your uh, presentation. Yeah. Do you and also you're... see me? Yep. Actually, okay. we see I've... you twice on the presentation and by the side. Yeah. So... <laughs> um, <laughs> great. The key is to see me at the bottom of the presentation. I found it, it's many people, yeah, me too, right. find it okay. less um, tiring to look at the presentation when the speaker is... Um, in the same picture as the slides. Now, um, I don't have any roosters around the house, but like Mariano, I am actually um, outside of the city. And so if anyone on the panel hears the sound quality go down or anything like that, uh, please feel free to let me know. All right. So I think this is a super important uh, issue, what happened to the bond market. I think the corporate bond market specifically, it's um, really an interesting episode last year and this paper is uh, shining a lot of light on this episode. So the credit market experience, just to put it, the whole thing in context a little bit is pretty dramatic. Um, credit spreads for triple B rated bonds. So these are the lowest quality corporate uh, bond uh, investment grade corporate bonds mm, went up from around 130 basis points to around 490 basis points uh, in the time span of a couple of weeks. So this is prices that you can see the recovery too. This is actually until uh, basically now. So by now we're at all time lows, but it recovered quickly. But the spike was uh, really high, not as high as the global financial crisis, by the way, but maybe about half of that or two thirds. And what this paper shows is that it was also a time when it was very difficult to trade corporate bonds in that uh, trading costs were high. Um, so just to restate what the, I think some of the key findings are, the paper, number one, transaction costs increased by around 200 basis points by their measure. Transaction times increased. So the share of trades that were done by agency, meaning you the, uh, the trader has to wait a long time for execution, went up by about 15 percentage points, which is a lot. 
Once the Federal Reserve announced interventions in the corporate bond market and with dealers, uh, in, the recovery was swift, but it was incomplete. We use, uh, sorry, we use, the authors use, <laughs> I can't take credit. There's enough authors already on this paper. Um, the authors use a structural model, which I think is cute, and, and to infer which market participants uh, shifted preferences and the welfare costs. Um, and conclude that it was both demand and supply uh, that uh, changed. Demand and supply of immediacy. Uh, one way to formulate what the takeaway is here is to say this is loosely consistent, sort of consistent with the idea that the crisis, when the prices dropped at the same time, uh, bond investors were willing to pay more for immediacy for the ability to trade quickly. Uh, and dealers were less willing to do it. So both demand and supply mode. And intervention sort of cured the demand issue, but the supply of immediacy remained limited. And therefore the recovery was fast, but it was incomplete. This doesn't fit 100%. We'll talk a little bit about it, but I think this is a good kind of one-liner if you want to understand what the paper says about the corporate bond market. Okay, that went away. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So I have three comments, I would say, three broad comments and, and a reflection. So the first one is what was the scope of the secondary market facility? And um, what's the deal here with welfare and preferences? What does it tell us about the world? How is it that you can improve liquidity without changing balance sheet capacity? Or, or can you actually? And then I have some reflections about the importance of trading institutions. I, I guess a little bit related to the previous paper. Okay, so the Fed interventions, here's what I understand. Okay, at first they said investment grade only. They said they would buy investment grade bonds or ETFs that hold investment grade bonds or are based on bonds that are rated investment grade. So this is the definition of investment grade. This is the regular one it has to be rated triple B or better. Um, and then they discuss by whom and so on. Then the eventual terms included fallen angels. A fallen angel is someone who was investment grade and is no longer investment grade. The term isn't used that much, I guess, because the high yield market, this is kind of a terminology from before there even was a high yield market. So at that point, all the high yield bonds were, uh, were bonds that had been issued by an investment grade issuer. Nowadays, many firms issue high yield bonds, but that's a, a term for it. Anyway, I guess what the Fed had in mind was that uh, the firm that they would buy stuff and that will be downgraded and they would be forced to sell it. And so they said, as long as your investment grade by the announcement date, so it was March 22nd in these terms, you, we can still hold you. Okay, now there are many other high yield bonds out there that were not investment grade at any point or they were, but it was before March 22nd, 2020. And they were not covered as I understand by the terms at any point. Uh, so I think it would make sense to adapt to some of the regressions maybe to this. Um, and so are there enough fallen angels for this group to be meaningful for identification? Of course, the set of fallen angels is a tiny subset of all high yield bond issuers, but I think there's probably enough. This is from some SMP publication that shows there were a fair amount of downgrades. Um, around the first six months of 2020. Okay, that's what we're looking for, right? Things that were investment grade and were downgraded. Now, the timing here is a little bit different. They're talking about December 31st, but I think this could be useful and it could sharpen identification. Okay, um, my second point is welfare. And I guess I have two sub points. The first one is that the structural model implies that the increase in cost of trading or of immediacy was more detrimental to bond investors than the delay in trading. So I guess the, the fact that it was expensive to trade was more important than the fact that it took longer. The total costs were about 20 bips, we're recovering to 10 bips. Um, okay, taking a step back, if you say that was the problem, with this drop in prices in the bond market and the increase in spreads, 
I think that's a pretty weak argument for intervention. Saying there's a utility cost here, 20 basis points for a bunch of institutions seems like not the end of the world. However, of course, the motivation for trying to intervene here is broader and it's that the bond market dysfunction, it will impact corporate finance and investment and hence growth. And it, those welfare problems obviously are not in this simple model. And I just thought it was important to kind of point that out. And, and it's from a paper um, I wrote recently with Effie ben Melek. This is weekly issuance of corporate bonds. These gray dots are uh, 2009 to 2019, the same weeks. And then in red and the black line, if you can see that with the line, that's black dots with the line, that's the average for this previous 10 year period. And then in red, we have 2020. And as you can see, the five or six, sorry, uh, four or five weeks with the highest bond issuance uh, in the corporate bond market in the US ever all occur in the spring of 2020 and exactly following the initial announcement and extension of SMCCF and PMCCF. And then there's a second peak here. Okay. Now, I really think this is about these announcements. And as a contrast, here's the loan market, the syndicated loan market, and there's nothing happening really in this. Instead, this is a very slow period. Some of the slowest weeks on record actually around here when the bond market is super active. Okay, so I think this is where the, this is the motivation for the, for the policy interventions and it seemed to have worked. Okay, that's just background. Okay, so my second uh, comment on welfare and preferences is I want to know why the preferences shifted. Okay, so the paper here is telling us they shifted rapidly, but why? And I think it would be cool to dig a little bit and maybe the data here allows it. So for example, to what extent can we separate by investor type? So identify if institutions that experienced outflows such as mutual funds were more affected than those that do not experience outflows like insurance companies and pension funds. I think this is a really crucial part of the infrastructure of the bond market. And it's really interesting to find out, um, you know, if it contributed to this change in preferences. What I'm saying is maybe it was the mutual funds who wanted, uh, who were super willing to pay for trading because they had outflows to meet or demand requests for uh, redemptions to meet. Another possibility is the leverage is important. So when things are difficult and leveraged institutions like hedge funds wanna sell and they're willing to sell at a lower price or willing to pay a lot to get transactions done um, and quickly. And so that's another possibility. And then of course we have behavioral factors. What about managers being upset or panicking and so on? So I think this might not be something you can answer conclusively with this data set, but I think maybe you can speak to it a little bit and that would be super interesting to me. Okay, my third comment is really about how this really worked. So here's a quote from the paper. Results suggest that the Fed's interventions, in particular the March 23rd announcement of the SMCCF, had a significant effect on dealers' willingness to absorb the inventory. The puzzle here is that liquidity was improved that announcement, but the purchase has only started in June for both the primary and secondary facilities. Okay. So if it's really the announcement here, then it's then we're not talking about balance sheet capacity. And so then I don't understand why their willingness to absorb, absorb inventory would shift. So I think it's possible to make this work. Maybe it's something like this. If I know there's gonna be some buyer in a few months time, then I'm more willing to be the buyer now because I think it's less likely that I will be stuck with some asset that I don't want. Okay, I think that's one possibility. Another possibility is that the primary dealer credit facility was more important. That was announced on March 17 and went operational on March 20. So around the time when we see big changes in those balance sheets. Um, and that, you know, maybe that's a, something to consider a little bit. And I think maybe the authors are in a position to say a little bit more here. For example, using exact dates. It is, for example, possible that the PDCF is more important for investment grade bonds 
And I think that, you know, that will perhaps be worth exploring. I really want to know which policies worked and, you know, it may be complicated, obviously, maybe they worked together and so on. But I think this paper is a, a, an opportunity to find out a little bit. Finally, not really a comment on the paper, but just a, a, a highlighting a takeaway, which is it's important to understand who's providing liquidity here. We do care most about liquidity provision and price formation, the quality of price formation in those periods when there's stress. And this episode highlights the limited ability of the current set of market makers and institutions to supply liquidity in the corporate bond market at the time when we need it the most. Um, but there are other options. So we could imagine that we should re rescind the Volcker rule to make the, the market makers more willing to hold bonds but other institutions can provide liquidity as well. You know, are the rule changes that should be considered? What is the best arrangement of this market? Are there policy options for setting up efficient bond markets? Um, maybe this paper, you know, the authors may not feel that they're in a position to draw strong policy conclusions, but I do think it's interesting to reflect on other institutions than market makers can provide liquidity and, and maybe we don't have the best system for that right now. So that's another option, but obviously strengthening market makers is one way to go. All right, those were my comments. Uh, thank you again. Thank you very much, Bo. Um, anyone else that wants to comment or ask a question? You can go on the Q&A or if you're on the panel, you can just raise your hand or talk. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Maybe I'll just ask or comment following uh, Bo's comment about Yeah, can I staff? actually respond to yeah. his comments? Because uh, all of his comments were basically we thought about most of his comments, actually. Thank you so much, Bo, for a uh, okay. uh, great discussion. Uh, so first thing first, I mean, we're not going to have anything to say, as you said, about like welfare, because I mean, we don't have a corporate sector. We cannot really say with a simple model anything about the welfare. Just like let's that keep that... Uh, uh, say that and from the get-go. So what we're say just saying is about the uh, net utility that the customer gets from uh, moving to this high quality trade. So that's what we I can do and nothing beyond that. So we're pretty clear about that in the paper. And I don't want to say that we can actually talk about welfare without having a corporate sector or defaults or like other things that the Fed intervention uh, actually did. So the question about like why preference shift is of why there was this dash for cash or who which which customers actually ended up uh, being responsible again unfortunately as you said with this data set that we have with trace even with the regulatory version of trace we cannot have customer identities unfortunately we can have dealer identities but we don't know what who customers are we can have kind of suggested evidence from looking at mutual fund flows most likely there were mutual funds but unfortunately we're not going to be able to say anything about uh, either there were hedge funds or uh, or uh, consumer uh, mutual funds uh, that did this uh, very responsible for his dash rates. Unfortunately, we don't have this data. The question of okay, balance sheet. Like, these are just announcement effects. Uh, how would it be possible to have balance sheet? Again, we're not going to be able to say anything about wh which was the channel through which the dealer in the intermediation. Uh, got impacted. Was it balance sheet? Was it reducing dealers at risk aversion? Why is, why is, was it because of uh, uh, maybe reducing the uh, uncertainty in the market? Again, very agnostic. We, I mean, obviously can, cannot but certainly say that uh, just reducing uh, announcement effect led to uh, ba uh, improving balance sheet impacts. There was obviously the uh, SLR constraint that was relaxed that had something to do with that for the treasury market. But again, we're not going to be, uh, we're agnostic about the source of the uh, the cost function that we have in our models. It could be balance sheet costs, there could be reduction in risk aversion, could be reduction in volatility, uncertainty, or, or so forth. And again, lastly, we just said about who provided liquidity. Okay, and given like we have something to say about that, given the fact that we see this like uh, during the crisis, uh, these uh, uh, low quality agency trades went up by a fact uh, by 15 percentage points, points, basically saying that other customers ended up providing liquidity during this time. We see dealers actually did not provide any liquidity. They became actually net sellers. So there are anecdotal evidence that guys like Pimco, BlackRock, these were eventually liquidity providers during this time. Actually, we're doing another project 
uh, that uh, using some data from an electronic trading platform that now we can actually see who did provide liquidity during the crisis, there is suggestive evidence that dealers were not, again, consistent with what we did using trace data that other customers were provided liquidity during this uh, during this episode. But again, again, thank you so much for your uh, points. They're all uh, thought, things that we, we've been thinking about uh, since we started this project. Appreciate it. So thank you. Actually, I see we've come to the end of our uh, session. So I think we'll stop here. So thank you everyone, presenters, discussants, and uh, the audience, and uh, have a nice weekend, all of you. Uh, goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank all. You. Thank you very much. Bye, thank you.